So hope everyone's having a, a wonderful day and a uh, good start to your Sabbath. Hopefully you had a good night last night. Let's see here. Now, I have many things to be thankful for in my life, and yet sometimes if I'm not forget, you know, not, not on top of it, I'll forget some of the things I'm thankful for. You know, um, our minds are something that we constantly have to protect. And I brought this little, um, I guess, what would you call it? I think this is uh, probably made out of, uh, what's the, what is this called? Ceramic. Ceramic. I remember when I was a young kid, my mom had a friend uh, named Sandra Gibson. And I, I, I don't know where Miss Gibson is. She probably, last time I checked, she lived in Florida. But Miss Gibson's uh, mother had a uh, ceramic uh, set up in her house out in Uey Town. And it seemed like every time I'd turn around, I'd be getting a new little ceramic uh, thing. One time it was an Indian, but this is ceramic. And of course, for many years, for those of us that uh, grew up um, keeping the, uh, the Sabbath and the Holy Days in the church, uh, this was a very famous logo. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that today. And it's the, the lion laying down with the lamb. Uh, of course, in the scripture, it refers to a wolf as well. And uh, the various just different things that are going to be changed in, in the creation. So let's start, start off by turning to Isaiah chapter 65 and uh, reading a few of those verses. Took me a minute. I don't know how many people still do ceramics. I don't, I don't know if that's still a, a thing, but at that time when I was growing up, it was, a, uh, it was kind of a hobby of a lot of people. Uh, and you, know, you would buy these, these objects and then you would paint them and some people could do them better than others, of course. But I wanna start off by reading in Isaiah chapter 65 and we're gonna start off in verse 17. In uh, verse 17, and it says, uh, For behold, I create a new heaven, a new earth, and the former things uh, will not be remembered nor come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem, a rejoicing, and her people a joy. I will rejoice in Jerusalem. I will joy in my people, and the voice of weeping will no more be heard in her, nor the voice of crying. I just stop there for a second. We have some people that, that attend here that, that in the years past went and visited Jerusalem. And you think about that today, I've never been to Israel. I've always wanted to go, but I've never been. But Israel is not a safe place to go these day and time. And it hasn't been for many, many years. It's a place that you, you know, it's, it's not like Disney World, in other words. There's, there's a lot of, um, terrible things that happen in that country because you have various organizations fighting amongst each other, Muslims, Jews, Christians, all of them focus on that spot as a, a place where their religions uh, began. And so we read here in the scripture that Jerusalem is going to be a place of joy, not of crying. And that's what it is today. It's a place of crying. It's a place, a place of, uh, you know, death. It's not, a, it's not a really happy place. Picking back up in verse 20, there will not be an infant who lives but a few days, nor an old man that has not fulfilled his days. For the child will die a hundred years old, but the sinner who is a hundred years old shall be accursed. And they will build houses and live in them, and they will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. And all of these things that we're talking about that are gonna take place one day in Jerusalem can't really take place today. Today, there's kids that they have to search them to make sure that they're not a suicide bomber. And you think about that for a moment. That's a, that's a terrible thing. A young child potentially could be someone strapped with explosives to kill himself and others. And that's the world that we live in. And picking back up in verse 22, they will not build and another live in them. They will not plant and another eat for like the days of the tree, all um, or so will be the days of my people and my elect will long enjoy the work of their hands. They will not labor in vain, nor bring forth children for calamity, for they are the seed of the beloved of the Lord and their offspring with them. 
And it shall come to pass before uh, they call, I will answer. So think about that. Before they call, I will answer. You know, we we just sang a song where it talked about hearing the prayer of children, right? And we all want God to hear our prayers. But it says there's coming a time where before you even call for him, he'll be there to help you. That is amazing, right? That's amazing. And while they are still speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb will feed together and the lion will eat straw like the ox. You know, you can go on the internet and just pull up lions and you'll see them attacking zebras and all kinds of animals. But yet in the future, it says this guy right here is going to be eating straw. The whole creation is going to be changed. And dust will be the food of the serpent. So you're not going to have to worry about snakes anymore. This uh, past week, we found three snakes in our backyard. You know, not poisonous ones, but unfortunately for them, they're dead now. You know, and so they will not hurt nor destroy in my holy mountain, says the Lord. Now, we've read these verses before in Isaiah 65. And, you know, just a few weeks ago, we were observing the Feast of Tabernacles. And as a young boy, I would hear these verses in sermons and Bible studies and uh, even in hymns. But there's a, a very familiar one, and we didn't sing it this year at the feast site that I was at. But a very uh, common song that would be sang sometime during the feast it was a song that was uh, one verse where it says, little child, it won't be long now. And you all know that song, or many of you do. I remember thinking how great it would be to not be scared of a wolf. You know, as a child, you grow up learning about the, you know, the red riding hood and the, the wolves, right? You, 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 your certain animals are depicted very, very similar to the day when you go to the beach now, you don't like to get in the ocean because you're scared of sharks, right? Well, I always wondered what it would be like in the future to be able to walk up and pet a lion. Just, you know, the the ability to do that. It's completely different. That was a, you know, my mindset when I was 10 years old, you know, and I never really realized until recently how powerful these verses are that we just read and how they impacted me. If you understand these verses, it's all about hope. We have a common enemy, and his name is Lucifer, or Satan, and he's out to deceive us all. And, you know, as a young boy, it gave me hope that there's better days coming. The scripture reading that uh, Mr. Pice just did, he talked about being prepared to give an answer for the hope that lies within. You and I live in a terrible world today. Terrible world. And it's only going to get worse. And the thing is, is what keeps us positive? What keeps us able to look ahead? And it's that we know what's going on. We know that there's something behind the scenes taking place. We know, as Churchill said, you know, there's a there's something bigger being worked out below here. It's not just everybody doing what they want to do and that Satan's in control. He's in control right now because God's allowing him to be in control and that there's something being accomplished. Let's turn over to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. And this enemy that we have, he wants the people that we see every day to have no hope. He wants them to have false hope. He wants them to think that that, you know, this is the way it is, but it's not. And in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, it says, Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil is prowling about as a roaring lion, seeking anyone that he may devour. Now, it's interesting. We said this, we read this scripture in Isaiah where we're talking about, hey, the line's going to be different. But right now, the line's not different. Right now, that line is used to describe our enemy. And I've said this before, and you always try to get people to understand. You watch these scary movies sometimes, right? 
and you see somebody walking down the street and you give the appearance that there's a person behind the bushes watching them like a, a stalker or a serial, a serial killer. Every one of us has that going on in our life right now. And it's Lucifer. He is the ultimate stalker. He is the ultimate serial killer. He is watching our every move trying to figure out how he can get you to go down the wrong road. He wants you to make a mistake. And when you make a mistake, he cheers. And this is what we have to keep in mind. So today we're being hunted. We have our own Garden of Eden story going on, you know, every one of us. Now we read about the Garden of Eden, but each and every one of us have our own Garden of Eden story going on right now, we're living it. And we have to overcome it. And we have to understand we can't do it without Christ. It's not, it's not that we gotta be stronger so that we can do it on our own. No, we need the help of our elder brother. And we must not forget that unlike man-made wars, the war that you and I are fighting is a spiritual war. And from time to time, it'll have some, some flesh pools in it, but ultimately what, the, what we're fighting is a spiritual war. And it's not easy. In fact, it's impossible for us to win without the help of Christ. So the risks are high. And the reason why they're high is because we're told in the scripture to fear the second death. To fear the second death. And that's exactly what Satan is trying to lead us to. Is a point where we will go too far. A point where we'll, you know, reject God's way. And then God can't use us. Let's go over to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1 and read a, a few scriptures here. Revelation chapter 1 and we're going to um, we're going to begin in verse 1. <clears throat> and it says the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave to him to show his servants the things that are ordained to come to pass shortly. He made it knowing, having sent his angel to his servant, John. And you think about that. God doesn't want his family, his potential family, his people to be clueless. And that's why the book of Revelation is there for us. Is that so we'll kind of have an idea of what's coming in the future. We might not know all the details, right? And it very well may not happen in our lifetime, but he gives us enough information so that if we're wanting to be committed, if we're wanting to be a part of this, we can stay the course. And in verse two, he gave witnesses to the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ and all the things he saw. Blessed is the one who reads those who hear the words of the prophecy and who keep the things that are written therein, for the time is at hand. Now we can say it might not happen in my lifetime or your lifetime, but we're all living our own Garden of Eden story. So in other words, the time is at hand for you and I, regardless if the return of Christ takes place in our lifetime or not, the time is at hand for us. This is our opportunity. John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace and peace be to you from him who, uh, who he is and who was, who is to come and from the seven spirits are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, to whom who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to God and his father, to whom be the glory and the sovereignty into the ages of eternity. Amen. Starting in verse 7, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye shall see him, and those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth shall well because of him. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is, who was, who is to come, the Almighty. Now, can you imagine... I don't know if you've ever seen this before, a storm, you're at the beach and a storm come up, right? Clouds can be on the spot in a second. Well, one day, according to these scripture, those clouds are gonna roll back like a scroll and Christ is gonna return. 
But look at verse six. He has made us kings and priests to God and his father, to him be the glory. You know, many times we've heard sermons and had discussions about being kings and priests in God's kingdom. And that's exactly what the scripture says. But we gotta be careful with that. And, and meaning that we still have to maintain being humble, understanding that we're not perfect, understanding that we're first, when, when we look at these verses, when Christ returns, we'll be first entering into the kingdom of God. Let's go over to Luke chapter nine. Luke chapter nine. In verse 46. So we're going to be court of the scriptures. If we're in the kingdom of God, if we're part of that first resurrection, we're going to be kings and priests. And, you know, in other words, we're going to have some responsibilities. And I think that's a better way to look at it. We're going to have responsibilities. Don't get caught up in the title. And that's what we're going to Luke here to read. Luke chapter 9 and verse 46. And when Jesus perceived the thoughts of their hearts, he took hold of a little child and he set it by them. And he said to them, whoever shall receive this little child in my name receives me. And whoever shall receive me receives him who sent me. For the one who is least among you shall be the great. Let's go over to Mark. Let's go over just a few pages to Mark chapter 10. We're really talking about the the attitude that we're supposed to have, the characteristics that we're supposed to have. Mark chapter 10 and verse 35. Mark chapter 10 and verse 35. <clears throat> then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him saying, Master, we desire and whatever we ask you uh, would do for us. And he said to them, what do you desire to have me to do for you? And they said to him, grant to us that we may sit one at your right hand and one at your left hand in your glory. That's interesting. Here we have the son of God on the face of the earth doing countless miracles, you know, healing the blind, healing the sick. And these two individuals, are wrapped up in the same thing that you and I have got to make sure that we don't get wrapped up in, and that was a place of authority. Regardless of saying, I just want to be in your kingdom. If I'm the guy that has to open the door, you know, if if I'm the guy that, if, if there are restrooms or back, if I'm the janitor, okay, that's great. But these guys, they're wanting specifically, I want to sit on your right side and I want to sit on your left side. In other words, caught up in the power. And in verse 38, it says, but Jesus said to him, you do not know what you're asking. So if I think about that, if we were to be these individuals, hey, can I sit at your, we don't even, they don't even really know what they were asking for. They can't even comprehend how much power that is that they were asking to have. Because God's kingdom is so much bigger than what we think it is. You do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink and to be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? And they said to him, we are able. And then Jesus said to them, and it's kind of like having that conversation with a kid and say, look, you really don't understand what you're asking about. And then you're hoping that your kid goes, okay. But your kid goes, no, I want to do it. Right? So he's like, are you able to do this? And they're like, we're able. And then Jesus said to him, you shall indeed drink the cup that I drink and you shall be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit at my right hand and my left hand is not mine to give, but to those for whom it has been prepared. You think about that in verse 41. And when the 10 heard this, they began to show indignation towards James and John. And Jesus called to them and said, you know that those who are counted worthy to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be this way among you. Rather, whoever desires to become great among you shall be a servant. 
and whoever desires to be first among you shall be the bond slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom. You know, why are these verses here for us to read today? We can change the names, but the desires of the men are the same desires that if we're not careful, we can get caught up in what job is God going to give me one day? And we need to be careful with that. We need to make certain that we aren't following Christ for the wrong reasons. You know, and the reason that we're being called right now is to be able to come out of sin and to see what this world looks like when you don't go God's way. That's the scales that have been taken off our eyes. It's the ability to see, my goodness, this world is terrible. You think about it in this country, and I didn't, I didn't look this up, but I heard this a long time ago and it made sense. Look at the number of hospitals that we just have in the Birmingham area. Hospital here, hospital there, doctor's office here, doctor's office there. And there's something we can learn from that. It's because we're sick. We're sick. And yet, regardless of how many hospitals get built or how many doctor's offices get built, guess what? There's not a one that can fix the sickness that takes place in this world. And I'm not talking about physical ailments. I'm talking about mental because we have this line that is trying to destroy us. Let's go over to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. So we see here that, and, and it's real easy to point the finger and say, ah, oh, I'm not like, like they are, but we would have said, if it would have been one of us, we would have said the same thing. Hey, hey, Christ, can I sit at your right hand? So it's not for us to boast. These verses are meant for us to learn from so that we don't fall into that same category. So that one day, if we are in the first resurrection and Christ says, I need you to take care of the, you know, whatever, we say, yes, sir, be more than happy to, you know and not look over our shoulder as he's sending the other person down the other hallway, so to speak. Matthew chapter 18 and verse one, we're gonna read a few scriptures here. And at that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And after calling a little child to him, Jesus set him in their midst and said, truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become as a little child, you are converted and become as a little child Children, there is no way you shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever shall humble himself as a little child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever shall receive one, such little children in my name shall receive me. Now, we, we can learn a lot from this. You know, you, you think about children. We'll have a potluck here sometimes, right? Food gets all set up. And me, I'm ready to go through the line because I'm hungry. But kids are running around, they're playing, they're having a good time. They're not worried about that. You know, and a lot, most of the time you'll see the parents going through the line making their plate. They're not worried about what if there's no food left? Right? Now, I'm not saying that so nobody goes through the line next time we have a potluck. But my point is, is that he continued to put children in the midst of them so that they could see. They're sitting there carrying on these big, gigantic conversations, and those kids were probably sitting in the dirt playing with toys, right? And these guys are fighting over, can I sit at your right hand? Can I sit at your left hand? And he's like, you need to be like that kid. You need to be like that kid. And you look down at the kid, he's just happy to be here, right? And that's the, what we can learn from that. We can still learn a lot from this verse in Isaiah. And let's make sure we're focusing on how Christians return or Christ return brings hope and puts things even in creation back at peace. This world, the way that 
this whole environment. This is not the way it was intended to be. Now, I'm not a tree hugger, right? I'm not some big environmentalist, but on the, on the flip side, that's because it's been taken to the wrong or the extreme. God is an environmentalist, if you think about it, but not taken to the extreme we see, right? He wants this creation to do what it was designed to do. He's not, he's not for drinking water being polluted. He's not for animals attacking each other either. That's Satan. He's turned everything upside down. And that's what this verse in Isaiah is supposed to open our eyes to. So when you think about these animals, you know, I start thinking about that and I'm like, well, it really wasn't that childish to think about that. So that when I read that verse and I got, man, one day I'll be able to hold a snake. I remember years and years ago, Benjamin was much younger and we had a birthday party and they brought a bunch of animals to the house. And one of the animals was this gigantic snake and the kids got to hold it. Now, of course, this was a, a, a snake that we're not worried about attacking young children and everything, but the snakes that are described in the Bible are poisonous snakes. And so, this creation being turned back the way it needs to be. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 11. And I want to uh, read a different scripture here and hit on a couple of other points. Isaiah chapter 11, and we're gonna begin in verse one. And you've, you've read these scriptures before and they're very similar to the scriptures that we read at the beginning, but it's a different one. In Isaiah chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. And there shall come forth a shoot out from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Now, I'm going to stop there for a second. I'm getting off on tangents today. But I think about this, and let me tell you how. In front of my house, I used to have this gigantic holly tree. There was one on each end. They were huge, taller than me. Well, all of a sudden... The one on the left end of the house, it just died. Okay, or excuse me, the one on the right end of the house, it just died. And the one on the left, and I mean, so my house looks, it's like they, it was, they were, but there was one on each end. Well, now one's dead. So my neighbor comes over, we cut it down, haul it out to the road, right? Now I got this one on one end. And you can't, I can't go buy one that big, or I could, but it'd be very expensive. So I go, you know what? We're just gonna cut that one down too. So we cut that one down, right? And then I did a bunch of planting, and this is over the last few years. So both of the holly trees are gone. They're gone. New plants are planted, yards looking great. And all of a sudden, up underneath that bench that I, where the holly tree used to sit, I sit it, and guess what's popped up out of the ground? A shoot out from the stump of Jesse. And I'm, I'm sitting here, and the thing is, is, wait a second, no, I cut that tree down. It's gone. And you think about that. That's exactly what Satan thinks he did with Christ. He came in the flesh, and he hated him. And he tried to tempt him, and he overcame. And then, as a last resort, he turned the very religious leaders of that day against him and they crucified him. Christ gave his life willingly, but he crucified him. And we know he was in the ground and he was resurrected. But he's returning. And when he comes back this time, it's from this. And I, I saw that the other day and I went, well, I kind of, that reminds me of that scripture because it's about this tall, shooting out of the ground. And guess what I'm going to do tomorrow? I'm going to cut it down because that tree is, I'm not going to let it come back. Okay. But you see the example. And in verse two, it says, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him and the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel, might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. You think about that. Our delight is supposed to be in the fear of the Lord. Think about that for a minute. 
when we properly fear God, it's we respect him and we try to honor him and we try to keep his ways because, not because we want to not work on the Sabbath. I can't think how many times in my life that there's been sales opportunities that I turned down that would have taken place today. But we do it because why? Because we have proper fear of the Lord and because we're showing our obedience to him in anticipation of him showing us more and us being blessed. And in verse five, and the righteous shall be the girdle of his loins and faithfulness, the girdle of his reins. And in verse six, also the wolf shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the kid and the calf and the cub line and the fatling together and a little child shall lead them. And a little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed their young ones, and they shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And the suckling child shall play on the hole of the axe, and the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. In other words, stick his hand down in a hole where snakes are. And they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. This earth is not full of the knowledge of the Lord right now. Nowhere near it. And in that day, there shall be a root of Jesse standing as a banner for the people to him. The nation shall seek and his rest shall be glorious. His rest shall be glorious. In other words, his Sabbath, that word rest, his Sabbath, shall be glorious. Think about that. How, you, you think about the command of keeping the Sabbath. People get so upset about it, that fact that God has said, I don't want you to work this day. And that drives people nuts. But yet any boss can go up to any employee Monday through Friday and say, hey, I don't want you to work on Thursdays now. Take Thursdays off. And every employee would go, this is awesome. I don't have to work on Thursdays anymore. But God the Father looks at us and says, hey, listen, on Saturdays, I want you to relax. I don't want you to work. I want you to learn about me that day. I want you to take a day off. And people say, this is just terrible. He's imposing his will on me. Right? I've got one friend of mine, he owns a, a garage door company. And every time I see him, he says, I work every day of the week. And you think about that, we would. We would work every day of the week. And before you know it, we'd be 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years old. And we would say, did we ever enjoy life? Did we ever enjoy it? We've got a lot to learn and I want to, I want to bring something out to you. And this is just food for thought in Isaiah chapter 11. We just read these <clears throat> in verse six. I want you to look at something. Also the wolf shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the kid and the calf and the cub line and the fatling together and a little child shall lead them. A little child shall lead them. If we understand when this takes place, this is uh, after the first resurrection. And if you and I are in the first resurrection and God has given us various duties and that's what we were talking about, you know, what will our capacity be? Let's go over to Revelations chapter 21. Revelations chapter 21. And in Revelation chapter 21, we're going to read one scripture. <clears throat> and it says, the one who overcomes shall inherit all things. And you think about that. What is all things? You know, 
Um, my parents recently passed and my sister and I have two brothers and we ended up inheriting all the things that our parents had. And these were physical things. And we sat down as a family and one person wanted this, one person wanted that. And we, you know, rightfully split the various things. We inherited all the things that they had. When we look here in Revelations in 21 and verse 7, they shall inherit all things. When God the Father allows you to be a part of his inheritance, you are talking about the being that created all the heavens and the earth, the things that we don't even know exist. Every time you turn around, a, a, a Satellite says, hey, we've found another galaxy. We don't even know how big this inheritance is. There's no way to put a dollar amount on it. There's no way to put any kind of figure on it. And he says, you're going to inherit it. And it doesn't matter that we're going to have to split it with thousands of other people because it's so big that it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if I'm having to share it with Becky. Right? It doesn't matter if I'm having to share it with Mr. Buys. It, do, it doesn't matter because it's so big that whatever I'm allowed to have, it, I, I don't even deserve it. And we look here in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 7, and it says, and here is the ultimate, in my opinion, here is the ultimate part of the inheritance. And I will be his God and he will be my son. I'm a human being. My son's a human being. If at that point, I am a son of God or a daughter of God, that means that I'm part of God's family. That means I am now a spirit being. That means I am now a God. With the proper mindset, not to argue over position, but I'm part of that family. I'm part of that family. That is the ultimate inheritance that we're going to be part of that family. Now, I have a question for you. And keep Isaiah chapter 11, verse 6 in mind. A child will lead them. A child will lead them. What's the youngest member of a family? What's the youngest member of a family? It's a child. You know, you could say a baby, but it's a child. Is it possible that this verse in Isaiah that we've read a million times about the lion and the lamb, and when it says a child shall lead them, is it possible that that's talking about you and I? We will be children in the kingdom of God. We will be new in the kingdom of God. We'll be his sons and daughters. We'll be the newest members of that family. We won't immediately go to the status of, hey, just like Christ. No, he'll continue to be our elder brother. God the Father will continue to be God the Father. We're the children in the family. We're the newest members of the family. Think about that for a moment. To me, I was like a child leads them. What type of child? We read in the other scriptures when it said, before you even say what you need, I'll know. When you're talking to me, I'll start talking to you in the middle of your sentence. In other words, immediate connection, immediate opportunities. And if we understand correctly, this thousand year rule is when you and I will be stretching our wings, so to speak. It'll be our first opportunities to be in these various roles that God the Father has put us in. Is it safe to say we'll be children? That's what Revelation says, right? 
will be children of God. And so when you look at this verse in Isaiah, and I put that out as speculation, but to me, it hit me when I was at the feast and children will leave them. What kind of children? Just any child or children of God? God's children, God's family. Let's go over to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 11. And it says, Beloved, I exhort you as strangers and sojourners to restrain yourselves from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. Right now, you and I are strangers and pilgrims. This is really not where we know we're going to be forever. This earth is temporary. It's a, it's a temporary stop for you and I. Interesting words that Peter uses to describe the people of God. Personally, you know, we just went through a seven month journey, if you think about it. We started off in this room with Passover. Then we had the night to be much remembered, the days of unleavened bread. We went through Pentecost. God's, you know, holy days. We had trumpets and atonement. Then we had the Feast of Tabernacles and the last great day. We've just completed a cycle of all of God's holy days. And then we come back here and we're at the end of that cycle and we're here on the weekly Sabbath and it won't be too long until we start it all back up again. And you think about that, this past week was Columbus Day. But who was the greatest pioneer to ever, ever, walk the face of this earth. And it wasn't Christopher Columbus. And it wasn't Davy Crockett. It was Jesus Christ. And we don't comprehend what all he gave up to be able to come in the flesh. And the power that he gave up his authority that he gave up. He came from the spirit, came into the flesh. And you think about when this was being discussed before it actually took place. Can you imagine the conversations of, so for the first several years, I'm gonna be an infant. I won't be allowed, I won't be able to protect myself at all. But he didn't have to worry about that because he knew God the Father and the angels would protect him. There's a total commitment there, both parties on the same page, of this is what's gonna be done and there's no question whatsoever, without a doubt, that Christ was worried that God the Father wouldn't be there to help him. And what did he tell Pilate? I could call for my angels right now and they'd come rescue me. In other words, I could scrap this whole mission just like that. But he didn't because you and I, he didn't. He gave it up all, you know, he gave up every bit of it. The thing that we just talked about, about what we're going to inherit, inherit. He gave it up all temporarily, came in the flesh, lived among us for 33 and a half years. And there's no way to capitalize or put the word all in a big enough font to understand what all he gave up. And I would imagine that from Satan's perspective, he was doing like this. Just like he did with Job. When he went to God the Father and he said, hey, let me have a, a stab at him. And what did he do to Job? Ruined his entire you know, life when you look at it. And God would say, you can't touch him. And so Satan, very similar to Job, he thought, this is easy. And we go through, and I should have written those verses down, where he took him to the top of the uh, temple. He, he did everything he could do. He attacked him right after he was fasting, when he's the weakest. After fasting for 40 days, you and I fast one day. And we're like this, you know, oh, 
where we're going to go eat, right? And, and we think about those things of what all he gave up so that you and I could have an opportunity to be in that family. And we can't comprehend it. We can't comprehend it. And I wrote this down because we just got back from the beach. But I could turn around and I could look that way and I know Florida is that way. I can't see it. I can't see Florida, I, my eyes aren't that good, right? But I know it's south of here. So the things that Christ gave up for you and I, we, we really can't see them, but we know they exist. And they're so big, they're so big. Let's go back over here to First Peter and start back in uh, verse nine. And just pick back up and it says, but you are a chosen stock, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for possession of God. And you think about that, a possession of God. We will be his people. He will be our God. <laughs> that you might proclaim his excellent virtues. The fruits of the spirit. You know, God, you hear people say, God is love. You and I don't even know what real love is, but we will. See, we love things that we, we have an attachment to. You know, I love my, my son because he's my son. And God loved us before we even existed. And we see here these virtues, that's gonna be what we begin to understand and become to have internalized, who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And that's still in the process of what we're going through. We still are in darkness. Even after many years of sitting here, even after many years of trying to keep the Sabbath and the holy days, guess what? There are parts of my life that are still in darkness. And there's parts of my life that I think that are in the light that are still in darkness because it's a process of us coming out. And in verse 10, who once were not a people, but now are a people of God who had not received mercy, but now have received mercy. You think about that, who were once not a people. In other words, part of a community, part of a family. And that's what God's building. He's building that family. Why? Because, you know, as Ron Dark put it in one of his books, the lonely God. He's building his family. He doesn't want to be by himself. And we can learn a lot from that right at the beginning of the Garden of Eden when he just made Adam. And what did he see? He saw that Adam was lonely. He wants us to be a part of his family. He set forth for us a, a route to take. And at this time, you and I are having the opportunity to be called, to be part of this nature that's gonna change where animals and the way in which we know them today won't be that way anymore. Places on this earth like Jerusalem where missiles are dropping into it are gonna be peaceful places. There won't be any more crying. There won't be any more death. All of those things, why? Because the one who's behind it is going to be a put into a bottomless pit from according to the scripture for a thousand years. So things are gonna go back the way they're supposed to be. You wanna be a part of that? I do. We can learn from the scripture. We don't need to get caught up in trying to fight over what position we're going to be in that. We want to be humble. We want to be as children. And when we look at that verse in Isaiah and we see where it says, and a child will lead them. If what I'm proposing is right, that verse could be very well talking about you and I. And you know, one of the things about God 
that's amazing that puts him on such a higher level than all of us is that I can send a person a text. And in my head, that text was supposed to mean this. And the person will look at the text and go, oh my goodness. Why not, did you, no, no, I didn't mean that. I meant this, you know. That's why a lot of times they said, no, you don't need to text things. You just need to talk to people because people can look at something a certain way. Have you ever thought about the ability that God the Father has? We know this book is inspired by him. And that means the ability a lot of times that you and I can turn to a verse and we can read it. And you can say, this is what this means. And you can say, this is what I see in this. And you can say, this is what I see with this. And here's the thing. We're humans. So we say, well, do you think she's right or do you think she's wrong? God, the Father, has the ability many times to write verses that both of you are right. Both of you are right. Because he has the ability and the knowledge to write on such a level that he can say, I'm going to write this this way because it's going to fix this problem, this problem, this problem, this problem, this problem, with one sentence. And, you, and, and we think, no, 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 it's, it's, it's this way, right? And so when we look at these scriptures and as we continue to study them, just as a, a ending uh, note of free advice, don't always paint a scripture into a corner and say, this, yeah, this right here means this and that's what it means. Because God is a lot bigger than that. He can take a scripture that you and I have read a million times and it can mean exactly what we think it means, but it can also mean three other things and can be applied to multiple situations. When you think about that, the way in which we can see that is with the Passover. The Passover lamb going all the way back to Israel, they were physically putting the blood on the doorpost and the whole time we're looking at that sacrificial lamb, we're saying that represents Christ. But you know what? When they were doing it, they didn't know that. But those scriptures were put into place where thousands of years later, Christ was able to say, my flesh. And take scriptures that they had been raised on their whole life. And they say, well, they apply to this situation as well. And so... God's kingdom is going to return. We know things are going to get worse. And there might be opportunities in our life to have moments of, of happiness. And that's a wonderful thing. You know, having children, going to the feast, keeping the holy days, keeping the Sabbath, you know, having good meals with your family, watching your kids grow up. God wants us to experience those things. And those are happy things. But there's better days coming and hopefully you and i'll be part of that kingdom and when we first come into that kingdom we're going to be children of god we're going to be kids in our new family and who knows what tomorrow will have